The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the December Pacific Northwest Dues Drought and Climate Outlook webinar. Thanks for joining us. My name is Paris Edwards, and I'm with the USDA Northwest Climate Hub. This is a bi-monthly webinar series hosted by NIDIS, OCRI, and the Northwest Climate Hub. It's designed to provide stakeholders the Pacific Northwest with timely drought and climate information. Each webinar is tailored to reflect recent, current, and forecasted conditions and climatic events, and it also includes discussions of observed impacts and other relevant updates from across the region. The webinar is being recorded today, and the recording will be posted on drought.gov later this week. Um, also note that after today's webinar, you'll have the opportunity to give us a bit of feedback. That'll really help us improve the webinar series. So please do take a moment and let us know what you think. Today's speakers include John Abatsubu from the University of California, Merced, who will present the climate recap and current conditions. Then we'll hear from Andrea Baer with the National Weather Service Western Region, who will present the climate outlook. Next, we'll have Daniel Lavelle from the Oregon State University, We'll talk about how landowners can address post-fire erosion or landslide damage potential to their homes, property, or infrastructure. And then finally, we'll learn about how to get involved with two new grants. First, we'll hear from Bart Nyson from the University of Washington about an opportunity to improve drought impact indicators in the Pacific Northwest. And then from Ben Livneff from the University of Colorado Boulder about efforts to identify alternatives to snow-based stream flow predictions to advance drought predictability. Please use the chat box to ask questions during the presentations, and we'll address them during the Q&A period after the presentation. Before we move on to the talk, we'll briefly highlight the partners that make this webinar series happen. The Northwest Climate Hub develops and delivers science-based, region-specific technologies and practical information that assist agricultural and natural resource managers with climate and forest decision making. The Oregon Climate Change Research Institute, OCRI, is a network of over 150 researchers at Oregon State University. The vision of OCRI is to achieve a climate-prepared Northwest by building a climate knowledge network, cultivating climate-informed communities, and advancing the understanding of regional climate impacts and adaptation. And now I'll turn it over to Brett Parker to give a brief overview of NIDIS. Thank you, Paris. NIDIS's mission is to improve the nation's capacity to proactively manage drought-related risks by providing those affected with the best available information and resources to assess the potential for drought and better prepare for and mitigate the effects of drought. We want to improve our understanding of how and why droughts affect society, the economy, and the environment, and to improve accessibility, dissemination, and use of early warning information for drought risk management. Our approach to achieve that goal is to build the foundation of a national dues through the development of regional drought early warning systems where networks of partners and stakeholders share information and actions that help communities cope with drought. While the ultimate goal is a national early warning system, we recognize that impacts and early warning information differ across the regions. Each dues has many of the same base ingredients, but ultimately have their own flavor to reflect the needs of their region. The Pacific Northwest dues was officially launched in February 2016, and our updated strategic action plan is now available on drought.gov. So please mark your calendars for our next webinar, which will be February 22nd of 2021. And I also want to call your attention to a series of webinars uh, through the Northwest River Forecast Center. Their water supply forecast monthly briefings will start on January 7, 2021. And you can register for both of these information uh, webinars uh, on drought.gov if you look at the calendar feature and the date of the webinar. 
And before we launch into our presentations today, I will uh, facilitate our early warning system. More precipitation observations are needed. We encourage you to join COCORAS, the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. This is a unique nonprofit community-based network of volunteers of all ages and backgrounds working together to measure and map precipitation, rain, hail, and snow, as well as condition reporting. Observations by Coco Ross observers of precipitation events or the lack thereof are important events to capture and improve our understanding of weather. To become a volunteer or learn more, visit Coco Ross, or you can reach out to your local state coordinator. And I will put these in the chat box if you would like to reach out to those coordinators. Thank you. Thanks, Britt. Um, and next, we're going to turn it over to uh, the Climate Recap with John Abbasoglu. Hold on one second. I'm having to <laughs> authorize my, oh great. Um, can, Britt, can somebody there share their screen? I'm having a computer issue. Yes, give me, okay. <laughs> give me one second and yeah, I'll do it. Hold on, just give me one second to bring it up here. Oh, <laughs> okay, and then let's see. Oh, why is it? Now I'm having issues, apologies. I'm sorry, give me one second. I'm having trouble opening the PowerPoint. I don't know why it's not opening. Um. Britt, this is Andrea. Do you want me to go and come back? Um, maybe so. Let's do that. And I will try to figure out why the PowerPoint won't open. Thank you for that suggestion. <laughs> Let me turn Great. it over well, to then. you. <laughs> I'm an outlook. <laughs> OK. Okay, I will I will warm you guys up for John's great presentation that he's going to get when we get it fixed. <laughs> so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Baer. I'm with the National Weather Service at the Western Region Headquarters Office, and I'm going to give you the climate and drought outlook. So this graphic right here is a typical wintertime pattern uh, when we're in La Nina conditions, and we are in La Nina conditions right now. And as you can see, that jet stream that we usually um, have bring all of is usually displaced a bit further north during La Nina conditions, and that brings with it a bit weather, a bit wetter and cooler uh, weather conditions during La Nina. Not always, but th these are the typical um, expectations. So if we look at the past year, the evolution of the sea surface temperatures along the equator in the Pacific. At the top of this diagram is um, the beginning of the year. So um, January through roughly May, we had warmer sea surface temperatures across the Pacific, and that was our weak El Nino event. Um, then as we got into May, about mid-May, we, we transitioned more and the sea surface temperature started cooling off and more towards La Nina. And then as we got um, into the fall, we actually did go into La Nina conditions um, starting about in September, October timeframe. Um, things cooled off enough to be considered a La Nina event. This graphic right here is the weekly 
uh, sea surface temperature departures. And the area that we like to look at the most is this Nino 3.4 area where I have the blue arrow. And um, if you want to know where that area is in the Pacific along the equator, it's down here along this um, this axis right here, right in between uh, Nino 4 and Nino 3. And that's kind of a sweet spot for telling us uh, whether or not we we are possibly in La Nina or El Nino conditions. So right now the sea surface temperature departures are about minus 1.1 degrees C. And here's the map that corresponds with that. So you can see that transition that we went through in May to cooler conditions and then continued on, um, on a downward spiral there towards cooler conditions. And here we are uh, today in December. Hopefully everyone can see uh, my cursor there. Um, but yeah, when it's about minus 1.1, that's considered roughly a moderate type event. So we moved past a weak event and we're in a moderate, moderate event and it's most likely we're going to stay in a moderate strength event. So looking at the sea surface temperature departures in a little bit of a different way than what I just showed you, um, here's a map of the Pacific Basin. And as you can see, this nice cold pool of um, sea surface temperatures from uh, South America to past the uh, date line there, all along the equator equatorial Pacific, and then above average uh, sea surface temperatures in that far western Pacific area, which is um, very typical of La Nina. Switching to uh, the subsurface, this is a look at the central and eastern Pacific in the upper ocean. So from roughly the surface of the ocean down to about 300 meters, these are the temperature anomalies. And as you can see that that shift we made um, in the in the subsurface, moving into May and getting cooler, warmed up a little bit in the summer, but here we are in December and the subsurface is still pretty cool and our event is still ongoing. Looking at the uh, outlook for and so um, La Nina looks to stay in place through this winter. You can see there's roughly uh, about 95% uh, chance um, of continuing with La Nina conditions in this January, February, March season. And that continues through the winter. Once we get out of March, April, and May and into April, May, and June, things look like they're going to start to transition out of La Nina and into ENSO neutral conditions. I will say it's early, so um, it's not really something I'm predicting at this point in time, so don't, don't uh, quote me on this, but sometimes when we have La Nina events, we do get multiple years or two years in a row, so we'll see if that happens, but it's something to keep an eye out for whether or not we get uh, a multiple year or a double year of La Nina conditions. We'll see if that happens. Looking at the model output, what the models are telling us, uh, again, we're right about here. If you look at the observed, we're um, just in between minus one and minus 1.5 degrees C um, below average. And that means again we're in a in a pretty good moderate event um, and as we go out it looks like I was saying to you in the other graphic that we're going to continue this through about to April May June and then things will warm a bit back towards neutral um, this basically is showing you these top they're filled in squares there. Those are roughly the, um, the dynamical model output. And then the um, non-filled in circles are the statistical model output. And the dynamical average, so the average of all those models is in red, and the average of all the statistical models is in green. So that kind of tells you on average what those models are saying. And they're pretty close to each other until you start getting further out in time. This graphic, by the way, is a tad bit outdated. Um, a lot of the outlook information I'm, I'm going to show you, unfortunately, is a bit outdated. This will be updated this week along with all of the other graphics. So um, I expect this not to be that much different, though, when they do update it. I don't think there will be a wild swing in, um, in changes. 
So this is a busy graphic, but I like to show it because this shows you all of the variability and the different uh, types of scenarios that we get during La Niña's during winter time. So December, January, February timeframe. And on the left is temperature and on the right is precipitation. And as you can see, a lot of times the tendencies that I talked about in that first slide where you get the wetter and the cooler conditions does in fact happen. However, there is a lot of variability and no two La Niñas are alike. So we'll have to see what other factors play out and intermix and mix in with uh, the La Nina conditions to give us whatever we're going to be getting this winter. But typically from these past events, you can see what's happened. So it gives you a nice range of possibilities for what we've seen before. Also on this graphic, it's nice because these are separated into strong events at the top and then moderate events in the middle and then weak events towards the bottom. And again, there is variability in all these years it doesn't matter the strength, there's still variability, but you can see those typical patterns for the Pacific Northwest, again, is uh, wetter and cooler. Looking at snowfall, average snowfall patterns, um, this is for all La Nina years, no matter what the strength is. And um, it's a little outdated. I haven't been able to get anybody to update this map, so it stops in the 2008-2009 season but it's still worthwhile to show and this shows you the snowfall and the relationship with snowfall and La Nina and looking at the Pacific Northwest the difference or the departure from average is um, is definitely more snowfall on uh, on in a typical La Nina year and looking at that in a slightly different way looking at snow water equivalent and this would be snow water equivalent um, from all the past events on or about April 1st and this shows you the anomalies focused mostly in the west and as you can see again the message is um, above that 81 to 2010 average for the northern part of the west and then as you move further south it it gets to be less quite a bit less <laughs> as you move into the southwest but the Pacific Northwest um, this bodes well. I think things are tilted definitely um, towards a, a wetter scenario, which will be good for our drought conditions in the Pacific Northwest. So looking at the three-month outlook, again, this was made in November, so the new ones will be coming out very soon, and they will cover uh, January, February, and March. They'll be out on Thursday. Um, they will probably be a little bit different, but not much different than these right here so it's okay um, you know to, to look at these and and to show you these but basically the odds are tilted slightly towards uh, that below normal temperature and uh, wetter conditions for the northern part of the Pacific Northwest but as you move into the southern part of the Pacific Northwest things are a little harder to predict there and there's equal chances of being in either category Looking at the monthly drought outlook on the left and the seasonal drought outlook on the right here. And if we look at the monthly drought outlook for December, this was released at the end of November. And it looks like with those brown conditions that you see uh, up there in, in, especially in the southern part of the Pacific Northwest, I'm expecting those to persist through, the, through December. But as you move into the seasonal outlook, and that's for, um, Again, these are going to be released Thursday, but November, December, January, it looks like that we are expecting drought removal to be likely or those that areas that remain, they do improve some. So that again is, is the La Nina factor in here and the, the tendency to get those wetter conditions. So I always recommend that you keep an eye on the shorter range forecast, uh, specifically the eight to 14 day forecast that shows you out to two weeks what the expectation is in the outlook. Also over here, the eight to 14 day hazards outlook, you can look at if we have, if our forecasters have confidence that there will be above or below normal temperatures, precipitation, uh, snowfall, or windy conditions, they will put those on the map. And they'll show you when they have a slight chance or a slight risk of these conditions occurring or when they have moderate or high. So they definitely have a nice um, a way of showing you when they're confident. If there's nothing on the map, then the confidence isn't there. 
But this right here is a little bit old. These will be updated in about an hour. These are the week two forecasts. Um, they're gonna look fairly similar. I have had a sneak peek of them this morning of what the forecasters are working on. And it, it does look like the week of Christmas, December 22nd through the 28th, that, um, that nice Pacific flow you guys are gonna experience for <laughs> the next 10 days or so, it's gonna shut off a bit. And so you're not gonna have um, those above normal conditions most likely. Uh, during the week of Christmas, but um, and and a little bit on the on the um, warmer side, but those forecasts will be updated in in about an hour, like I say, on the uh, Climate Prediction Center's website. So in summary, we are in La Nina conditions. Um, I think um, there is reason to hope that drought conditions will improve in the Pacific Northwest when we are in La Nina conditions. Both the sea the sea surface temperatures and the atmospheric circulation is acting like it typically does with La Nina. So it's a pretty good event. Like I said, it's moderate in strength and expected to continue at least through the January, February, March season. And then we'll transition likely into and so neutral conditions starting in April, May and June season. And with that, I will leave you uh, with a picture of the typical pattern and I will turn it back to you, Britt, and hopefully um, John's got his slides up. Thanks, Andrea. And yes, next we'll hear from John Abatsoglu with a climate recap, if all is going well. All right, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, sorry for the snafu. Um, I am going to give everybody a rundown on sort of the play-by-play -play in terms of the climate and weather that have transpired over the past uh, couple months and contextualize where we are um, as of early December. And I'll, I'll sort of piggyback on uh, Andrea's uh, sort of preview because that sort of sets the stage for what drought may look like moving forward. So um, this is just a comparison of uh, the drought monitor maps two months ago on the left and last week on the right. And what we can actually see is there's a couple of things going on. We've seen a little bit of abatement of drought across the northern portion of the Northwest, namely in Western Montana, Northern Idaho, part of the Columbia Basin and Washington State. But we have the persistence of drought right in, in two primary areas, one in the lee of the Cascades in Oregon and Washington, and then across the southern tier of the Northwest, including much of Oregon and Idaho. Um, so those are the areas that we're gonna focus in on quite a bit. Um, and interestingly enough, one thing that we often see during a La Nina's progressive flow, we tend to actually get more precipitation in the Northwest, but those, those, those leeward, um, leeward slopes actually get a bit less. So not a great situation to have the current drought given the La Nina, but we'll take the La Nina because overall we have better than odd, better, better chances of above normal precipitation. So let, last 60 days, this is a set of maps from the climate mapper. Um, and, you know, what we can see, namely, first of all, it's been relatively dry, right? These are precipitation anomalies compared to the 1981 to 2010 normal, right? Much of the Northwest below normal. The exception, though, is you can see across um, parts of um, Montana, there's actually been above normal precipitation there. And I'll talk about that here in a bit. But by and large, below normal, pretty quiet. Um, and temperature wise though, it's been a little bit more of a mixed bag, right? Um, and one thing that we have seen with sort of more quiescent flow um, dominated by high pressure is we have a lot more sort of calm days and that promotes a uh, high level of um, atmospheric stability. We get a lot more inversions. And so you do see a tendency there in terms of temperature anomalies for below normal in the lower elevations and above normal in the higher elevations. One, so I wanted to just sort of highlight an interesting feature. So um, in, 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 uh, in Montana, in Western Montana, namely in Missoula, um, they actually had the sort of the snowiest October on record. Um, and part of that story there in terms of this footprint of above normal precipitation in Western Montana was a pretty wet 
um, pretty wet October. And so you can see just how, just how much snow fell in October, um, right? We're talking here upwards of, it looks to be upwards of almost 15 inches of snow in October in, in, in an event or two. So um, some interesting features there, but overall relatively quiet uh, over the past 60 days. And this is just looking at sort of potentially, you know, why that has been. This is showing us the 300 millibar height anomaly. This is a departure from normal as well. And what we're seeing here, the main feature is this big red bullseye right here. That is representing a anomalous ridge of high pressure. And so we typically have a progressive flow, right? The Pacific jet is coming into the Northwest. Um, this this pattern here is basically acted to block the flow, and so we've seen some incredible precipitation amounts across southeast Alaska um, into Canada. Um, that has been our precipitation that otherwise uh, has not fallen here. So that big block there has really sort of allowed for pretty dry conditions, especially for this time of the year. And speaking of this time of the year, um, these are just a couple, uh, you know, simple figures showing daily average precipitation. The side on top there is for um, Moscow, Idaho, northern Idaho, and then the bottom we have the headwork station just west, or, sorry, just east of Portland. And the main point here is that basically late November, early December is, is one of the wettest times of the year on average in the northwest. Okay. And the nice thing, of course, in the Northwest is that you do have a much longer period for precipitation. The reason that I'm bringing that up is that the last 15 days have been really quite dry, right? And this is showing just how dry they have been. And so across much of Idaho here, this is the, the sort of the dark brown is representing the, the lowest amount of precipitation that we've seen in at least 40 years for the same time period, which again is sort of one of the wettest times of the year. And on the right here, we can see temperature anomalies again, right, with the really quiescent flow, high pressure, lack of, you know, lack of storms. You, you tend to get um, some really interesting topographic heterogeneity with you know, above normal temperatures above the inversion, below normal temperatures below that inversion. Um, and that that corresponds if we just look at the circulation pattern over the last uh, this last 15 day period, um, this corresponds with actually a really strong um, uh, mode of the Pacific North American pattern. It's it's you know one of the sort of more faster dynamic attributes of climate variability that we see in the Northwest. So El Nino, of course, is certainly important. The Pacific North American pattern oscillates on you know weekly timescales. And you can see this sort of big, you know, big sort of these these four different, you know, nodes here, um, and and very much uh, we're in this nice sort of positive phase, which is very much associated with above normal temperatures, primarily in the mountains, and uh, you know certainly this is blocked precipitation as well. Um, just highlighting one station here, we have seen some very low precipitation totals in certain parts of the Northwest in 2020. Um, this is Priest Rapids Dam in the um, sort of east of the Cascades in Washington State, and we're basically tracking one of the driest calendar years on record for the site. Um, and you can sort of see that across um, much of the sort of the, the northwest, again, east of the Cascade Crest. Um, there have been some very low precipitation totals, and that, that's all sort of baked into um, the current drought monitor situation. Um, Andrew mentioned the evolving La Nina situation. We also are contending with a very large patch of very warm water off our coast that has been there for quite some time. Um, and certainly the sort of the blocking pattern that we've had recently has allowed it to sort of stay in place there. Whether that's gonna also play into conditions this this winter, certainly that that may that may factor in to some degree as air masses are maybe a little bit warmer coming in because they're traversing over somewhat warmer waters. Um, and then I'll finally touch on here very briefly the snow situation. So in, in November things were looking quite good, right? There was a lot of optimism for you know a good ski year. We have a La Nina on us. Um, we looked at some of the snow tell maps in you know around Thanksgiving. Things were fantastic. Um, of course, you know, there's always concern and, and caveats with looking at snowpack early in the year because you're dividing by a low number. Um, and so where we are today, we're still early in the snow season, um, but we have a, a sort of a more, maybe more interesting view of sort of 
current snowpack across the west. There are some numbers here in Oregon where we still have above normal um, snow water equivalent. Uh, much of Idaho, though, is you know in sort of below normal. Um, the hope, of course, is that with La Nina come sort of April 1st, right, or March, this will look substantially different. But right now you can see that there's a bit of a mixed bag. Idaho certainly is uh, below normal for much of the state. And then I'll, I'll add just this last figure here. This is from the Climate Toolbox. This is our sort of water watcher tool. We sort of compare amongst a variety of different data sets that represent drought in a common framework. And it sort of shows us, you know, both precipitation, you know, again, below normal for much of the state, soil moisture through some of the work that um, that BART is doing at the University of Washington, below normal as well, snow water equivalent, right, and then reservoir storage. Reservoir storage isn't terrible right now. There are some spots that are certainly below normal, but it's um, it's certainly an early time of the year. So to summarize here, it's been a relatively quiet autumn. We've seen drier than normal conditions the last 60 days, specifically across the southern tier of the Northwest. Um, yes, there were some wet conditions in Western Montana, some drought abatement there, as well as in um, Northern Washington and Idaho. Um, but where we stand today is that drought persists primarily in the Lee of Cascades, as well as across the southern tier of the Northwest. So I will end there and pass it back over. Thank you, John. Um, and next, we're going to turn to Daniel Lavelle. So Brett, um, oh, I see, show my screen, okay. <laughs> Can you, um, let's see. We're seeing your email right now, but now we're seeing your Google, oh, yep. Okay, uh, here, let me, so what I wanted to share, and uh, thank you for this opportunity, what I wanted to share um, was a, after the fire story map we put together. But first, um, here is our extension fire program website. And this is, I just wanted to show you, uh, here's the link and a uh, tremendous amount of resources before a fire, during and after. And I wanted to uh, go into the after a wildfire. And uh, this explains the map, and this goes to the site. And I wanted to um, go over that. So if you if you look at this, um, it's for the 2020 wildfires, but what we're doing is adjusting it to be for any wildfire season. So it can hopefully add. Uh, cumulatively to uh, the wildfire story and resource for landowners. Um, so what it is composed of, we have a resources page um, that will look at these groupings of resources for private landowners, federal state contacts, community resource guides, uh, pet housing, and uh, that's included in links and organized resources for private landowners to use for funding, for assistance, for knowledge, uh, help. Uh, there's just a, a number of resources. We're trying to make those bilingual, but um, not quite there yet but we have all of these categories of resources. We have, um, the, we have, let me go to how to use a map. It's, um, and I'll show you, I'll, I'll just walk through that really quick, but we have a tutorial on how to use this um, uh, for, for best results and talking about the keys and the tabs and the resources available um, and uh, the button functions and what data is available in layers and base map and uh, all the legends, how to read all of that, how to search for your property. And uh, it gives you a, a, as much of a tutorial as we could 
instructions and how to use that. And um, so it goes into the map and uh, there's a disclaimer there to use the map. And what you see here is, uh, here, let me get, okay. So what you see here is, um, we can, uh, for this particular case, you can go to a specific fire. And then uh, depending on scale, you have base maps, you have fire locations, legends, layers, you can uh, have the ability to draw, measure, and print off of this map. And the tutorial goes through each section. So if you're on the Beachy Creek Fire, here's an overview of that. And uh, you have all of your layers of data that are scale dependent. In other words, oh, I'll show you an example in just a minute. You have the base maps that you can, uh, excuse me, you can select uh, any number of base maps that you would want. And uh, going back to the, to the data, you see we have uh, statewide tax lots and fire perimeters selected, but you can just as easily select any one of these and you can see the gray ones, those are scale dependent. So you need to go further in before they would become present. And for instance, now we're in a fire perimeter uh, data and here's a one tax lot. Uh, obviously we excluded names and, and uh, addresses, but we do have the tax lot number uh, because of uh, privacy reasons. And so if you went to this specific tax lot, you can uh, go into the tool OEM developed for us. Uh, automatically, you, you bring up your map, your map, put in, uh, we filled in some identifiers and you can look at base uh, data for percent of property area burn, severity of burn, uh, and, uh, vegetation, uh, slope aspect. Um, we can we have all of these data available and burn severity specifics all to put on this map and uh, label the map, print the map, and that is available for for use. Um, like for instance, a landowner can then do their own uh, assessment and then uh, hand it over to NRCS for funding or uh, OEB or state and private, you know, depending on what other, what, whatever, whatever channels are open, FEMA early on. And uh, we, can, we can look at flood hazard zones for the maps. Um, so you can get a, a tax lot or tax lots. And you can measure acres, you can uh, go and you can search, you can put your name in here to search for individual tax lots. You can look at groupings of tax lots and you can assess landslide susceptibility. And um, I'll go into a little more detail on that, but landslide susceptibility or a riparian area damage. Um, we have watershed boundaries. We have sensitive soils. Uh, you can bring up a sensitive soil maps. In other words, if it's a, a sandstone based soil on a steep aspect um, that's uh, southerly aspected, but over 60% sandstone base, well, the probability of landslide and uh, or uh, flood hazard uh, goes up tremendously. And um, you, you can now get tax lot or tax lot specific information on all of those uh, data information, uh, such as when you go into how to assess your property, uh, we talk about uh, when you're heading home um, after the incident, 
uh, going around your property, what to look for, surveying for soil erosion, doing hazard tree uh, assessment, soil erosion assessment. And uh, we have a, a checklist if, if uh, the landowner doesn't want to use the uh, automated uh, uh, in data input uh, assessment. You have, we have paper fillable PDFs. We have a series of webinars that we've given to describe the checklist, describe uh, soil instability, erosion potential, hazard tree, how to do that on a series of webinars. Um, we have a flow chart on what a landowner could use. We have uh, maps, um, and then uh, we, we describe and characterize each step of assessment and uh, safety that uh, we're recommending you use uh, going to your property, around your property, inside your house, what to look out for, uh, what to assess. And once you get to your property, around your property, we try to go into remote sensing techniques and what why we've rated high severity, moderate severity, low severity, what, what that means. So we're using this all as an education outreach tool as well. And uh, so we want these tools to be used for assessment, for a record, for planning, and for education outreach. Um, and these webinars uh, link with this. And the web page, the fire program web page, links to this. And uh, we talk about risk of erosion or landslide and what soil erosion means, uh, what to look out for, what to watch out for. And uh, we go over all of the uh, definitions as best we can. Um, and then uh, we, we talk about how, what uh, some. Uh, uh, measures to take, um, mitigation measures to take, how to do a soil test. We go into hazard tree assessment and we link those to the webinar series videos that go into a lot more depth of explanation of this. And, and uh, we, uh, we talk about the terms and we give the graphics and uh, species, um, and uh, how to do a tree risk rating, and uh, along with the erosion potential. Um, and uh, um, so let's see what else um, mainly for. So this is not only for uh, post fire uh, specifically. I mean, it, it, that's was the original intent, but it can cover um, uh, soil erosion potential anywhere, fire or not, or landslide potential. When you go back to the maps and the base data, you can look at the probability of, of uh, soil erosion potential, fire or not. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm at uh, almost 12 minutes, and uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, demonstrate this resource. It's available uh, with the links and uh, for available for anyone, anyone to use. Um, and I, I hope it can be uh, uh, used, that the story can be uh, told and we can all learn from it. And hopefully we can mitigate some potential uh, uh, problems that come up. And I will leave it at that. Thank you, Daniel. Um, next. We're going to hand it over to Bart Nyson. Actually, I, hold on. <laughs> I think I have the same problem that John had. One second. Um, yeah, maybe we can run it off of John's computer or Brit's. I have to basically quit the app and reopen. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I can run it, Brit. I'll run John, it do you have? Okay, awesome. Let me turn it over to you. Just a second. Okay. Uh, Brit, this was Adam. <laughs> 
Oh, you got it. Sorry about that. John had it too. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. I mean, it, it's, yeah, sorry about that. It's on the Mac. It doesn't give me an opportunity to give permission in advance. It waits for the, for the question to share the screen. All right. So, um, my part of the presentation is, is very brief, actually. Uh, we're having a new project that is uh, NIDAS funded and we're looking for participants in this project. And so the project is called Drought Indicators to Support Drought Impact Mitigation for Natural Resource Management. And it's myself at the University of Washington, Bart Nyson, and then Catherine Hagewish and John Abatsiglou at uh, University of California in Merced. Next slide. And so this is a, a, an image of the climate toolbox that John also showed earlier, right? And in this particular case, I just elected to show the precipitation anomaly for the last three months. And as you can see over the Pacific Northwest, as John already said, actually, this is three months rather than two months. It was slightly wetter at the beginning, but we have over those three months, slightly drier conditions than normal, but maybe a little bit more precipitation over the North Cascades and so on. And so, the climate toolbox provides like a whole series of tools to assess this kind of phenomenon, right? It provides climate data, it provides hydrology data, it provides past information, near current, we do short and uh, seasonal, uh, short range and seasonal forecasting, and it actually also provides some climate change information. And then in addition to this climate mapper, which we're showing here, there's actually all kinds of tools that let you uh, apply it to a specific sector or that let you uh, compare different drought indices and so on. But what it actually doesn't do is actually translate these, um, these physical characteristics, like more precipitation than normal, uh, higher temperatures than normal. We don't have anything that actually translates that into an impact. Like, okay, so what does it actually mean for uh, resource management or for the recreational sector uh, if precipitation is higher than normal or temperatures are lower than normal? Uh, and so that's really what we're trying to get to in this project that we got funded. Uh, next slide, please. So the goal of this, and so it's a it's a new NOAA NIDA scoping with drought funded project. So uh, and the goal really is to address how science and information systems can better prepare community communities to mitigate drought impacts. And the first step in doing that is actually to link these drought phenomena to actual impact. Ultimately, what really what we want to do is improve the ability of drought managers to mitigate drought impacts through timely action based on relevant information. And to do that, our plan is to develop some tools that eventually will make their way into the climate toolbox and will be widely accessible. Uh, next slide. And so this is kind of where we have a call out to all of you uh, as the participants and the attendees on this call. Really what we're looking for is to engage with members of recreation and natural resource sectors in the Pacific Northwest to understand drought impacts uh, strategies for coping with drought, indicators of drought that you're currently using to make decisions, and the timeline for making those decisions, right? It might be that uh, knowing what the drought situation is currently is basically too late to do anything about it. So what kind of a lead time would you need and which kind of indicators are you looking for is what we're trying to find out. Uh, last slide. And so what we're looking for is input on three items. First, impact data sets. We basically want to uh, make a data set that lists kind of what impacts people have experienced in recent droughts, for example, the one in 2015 or so. Uh, what drought indicators are you currently using? And then we're actually looking for people who are interested in being an active member of our stakeholder group. And that's the group that we actually will have discussions with about items one and two. But also like once we start developing these tools, we wanna to make sure that we actually target the right tools for the natural resource and recreational sectors. Uh, contact, uh, if you're interested in participating, because we're really recruiting right now, uh, you can contact me at that first email address or John Abatsiglou at the second email address. Uh, and we look very much forward to working with you over the next two years. Uh, we're just at the start of this two year project the money was basically awarded a month or two ago. And with that, I'm done. Thank you, Bart. Um, and maybe a helpful addition would be to add those email addresses in the chat, just in case they oh, were yes. too quick for people to catch them. Um, all right, well, lastly, we're gonna hear from Ben Livna. Hello. 
Okay, thank you very much. And um, I will just get started here. Can you guys see my screen here? Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, um, yeah, I wanted to just take just a few minutes to make kind of a quick plug. Uh, thanks to Bart for that um, good sort of uh, interlude there. That actually was helpful to lay some of the foundation for this. We, we have this uh, Noah Nettis funded project that I, I, we're hoping we can get, get some interest in that looks at identifying alternatives to snow-based stream flow predictions to advance future drought predictability. I want to acknowledge my PI team, myself, Ben Livna, Benay Duncan, and Joe Kasprizik, who are all at the University of Colorado and involved with the Western Water Assessment. So the hypothesis that we're trying to test here basically is that um, we believe that snow will have reduced predictive power for stream flow under a future climate where in many regions snow is expected to decline. So here you have a um, just a kind of a conceptual diagram where you have these stations that are pretty common in uh, the Pacific Northwest and the Western US that are used to predict stream flow. So you have, you know, some pretty large peak snow that's used, you know, in April or March or May and is connected to the stream such that predictive models are uh, run in a kind of a, uh, a way that is consistent, relatively consistent year in and year out, decade in and decade out. So our hypothesis is that in the future, snowpack will be reduced. And uh, the relationship between what those stations observe and what actually um, comes through the, the channel and into the reservoir, that will change. And so we wonder whether there is an opportunity to identify alternatives to just snow. Um, and we want to get your input. So this is a three-year project. And our two focus areas are the Pacific Northwest and the Intermountain West. And so um, what we'd like to understand, you know, is from regional water managers, um, how you are currently uh, uh, predicting drought or what information you are using to predict drought. So we will then use that information to help shape our research and then um, look at the feasibility um, of alternative strategies and, and we hope to develop a narrative around those. So um, basically there's two asks, if you will. Uh, the first is that we're gonna send out a survey in the next six months to gather information on how um, entities are currently um, predicting drought and this will help guide our research. And then in about two years time, we hope to present the findings of that research, which will, our goal is to be inclusive of those strategies, of those techniques that we hear about. So whether it's, you know, statistical modeling, ESP or whatever, we're gonna try to incorporate those as well as some others in a machine learning framework. Um, and we'll sort of present what works best and um, maybe some of the current techniques that could use improvement. And so uh, that's basically it. If I have time, I can just show you a quick uh, result slide, but I don't want to, uh, I want to be sensitive of the time. We did experience some technical difficulties early on, so we're a little bit short on time, but you could um, keep your slide up and we could start to open it up and let some of the previous presenters start to address some questions at the same time, if that works. Yeah, perfect. Great. Um, so if we do have a few questions in the chat that pop up during presentations, but if there are any additional questions, please put those in the chat box now. Um, and I'll just go to the top. Our first question, I believe, was meant for Andrea. And uh, this person was looking for a figure of precipitation and temperature over the continuous United States as a function of La Nina year strength as whether or not a figure could be found somewhere. Is Andrea still with us? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, so a figure for, I'm sorry, what again? Precipitation and temperature over the continuous United States. I was wondering if the figure that you did present as a function of La Nina can be found somewhere. So it looks like it was a, a, a figure that you presented and they're looking for a link. Um, and maybe while um, waiting for that, yeah. 
I think this is the strength one that I showed. And um, yes, I got it off actually um, off of the uh, ENSO blog, which is on climate.gov. And there is a, they have all the archived posts in there. Um, I can quickly find it while you address another question and put it in the um, chat box, but it's basically in a past archived event of snowfall and La Nina, or excuse me, uh, La Nina winters, not snowfall. Um, so let me yeah. let me find that and I'll put it in the chat. Sounds great. Um, and then there was a, a second question for Daniel. Um, it was a clarification of whether or not the fire map was available for other states or if it was just for Oregon. And I'm sorry, this is Daniel. Britt. Daniel let me know oh. that he had to oh. step off. Um, so okay. we'll have to get that answer and follow up with you post-webinar. Sorry about that. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, and then there was a question about whether or not there's a current Lenina flood risk forecast for the Coeur d'Alene River Basin that helps citizens in the Bunker Hill Mining Superfund area. Um, and they're recalling there was flooding in 2008 there. That might be something that was directed at John, um, but also potentially for Andrea as well. Um. Yeah, sort of flood risk. I don't know if there's anything out there. There are some statistics that that might sort of, you know, help us identify that there's a higher probability of extreme, you know, very heavy precipitation. Um, but that might be very detailed. It, it could be related potentially to rain on snow type issues. I don't have a good answer to that one. Thanks for trying. Um, John, though, there's a, a second question for you. Um, what Madden Julian oscillation phases or phase are most associated with the enhanced precipitation in the Pacific Northwest? Wow. Um, good question. <laughs> I don't have an answer to that off the top of my head. I, I know that the CPC and others have some great resources for that. Um, that 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 the sort of the the phases of the MGO and how those influence precipitation extremes may also vary as, as a function of the time of the year. Um, but I don't have, that's not one I have off the, top, off the top of my head. Thank you for giving it a shot. <clears throat> I see another question that popped in uh, asking, I think uh, this would be for Bart and Ben, are there opportunities for students to participate on either one of the projects presented by Bart or Ben? <laughs> so, I mean, we have some money for students uh, basically who are currently at the University of Washington or maybe Merced, but it's somewhat limited. Oops, sorry for my dog. <laughs> okay. I actually I um, want to clarify that. Yeah. That's on a on a on a uh, research assistance, so a funded basis. I mean, if there's students who just want to work on the project as part of some undergraduate work or something as an intern or as a volunteer. I'm sure we can use their help. Yeah, I would say similar. Uh, just reach out to us if you have students who are interested and in, we can kind of see what uh, what might be available. This is Ben. Thank you both. All right, I see another question um, from Jeff Marty. I have a going into the weeds question, he says. In Washington State, we consider the water supply forecast provided by both NRCS and the National Weather Service River Forecast Center. NRCS uses statistical regression, whereas the Northwest or the National Weather Service uses a combination of deterministic models and ensemble forecasting. I'm curious if Ben has any thoughts whether NRCS or the National Weather Service is better positioned to adjust their methods going forward to account for the declining predictor of snowpack, or are they both doomed? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Well, that's a really tricky question, but I would say that um, that's one of the things we're trying to answer in our project. It would seem that the um, physically based or those conceptual models that the uh, river forecast centers are using would be um, a little bit better positioned to be already including some of the uh, different predictors, you know, because the models have vegetation and, and 
evaporation and all of those things. Um, that said, I think the statistical models being so um, relatively, you know, lightweight um, would be in a good position to easily adjust. So I, I understood that the NRCS might actually be moving more towards a machine learning uh, approach, which I saw actually at AGU that the conference is happening now. Um, so very good question. Hope I can answer that more clearly as we go forward. And maybe some of the other panelists have uh, better ideas than I do. Well, I think that's a good start. And perhaps um, a follow-up question for us to address in a future uh, webinar. But I, um, we've reached time. So I think that we should go ahead and just thank everyone for joining us. I remind you that the recording will be available on drought.gov later this week. And PDFs of the presentations can be accessed uh, if you email Britt Parker. If you have any additional questions, you can reach out to the speakers directly. Their contact is posted on the slide that you can see now. Um, and do remember to mark your calendars for the next webinar on February 22nd. And with that, I'll just say Happy New Year. <laughs>